still surprised he didn't make it to the second week. Like even if he's playing mm-hmm. poorly, like you still expect like as a minimum for him to get to the second week. Um, but even in that match when he lost, he was already nearly two sets down before he yeah. got the injury. So I think that's the more concerning thing. I'd say what for me, he made the first week of the men's draw for me. He made it as interesting as it possibly could be, um, based on. Oh God, I wish I had an ounce of his fight, an ounce of his determination and, and just that, that will not to give up, even when it looks like he's two sets and a breakdown. What is interesting is none of the stars of Breakpoint, if you've watched this series, uh, have made the second week. In fact, a lot of them never even made the first week. They were injured before they were allowed into the tournament. So a little bit entertaining there, but is there a curse going around? What do you reckon? Then you've got so many other players that like could do well one tournament, could do badly another tournament, and then yeah. it's like hard to form, like you said, a, like an allegiance around players like that when, you know, it's so it's still so up and down and inconsistent. Whereas, you know, with team sports and stuff, you're kind of with them anyway. Welcome back to the Getting Grip podcast. We are currently in the middle of the Australian Open as we speak, assuming this goes out relatively soon <laughs> otherwise all of this is completely out of date um yeah there's been i mean it's been, it's been it's been a fun tournament it's been more open open than it normally is normally it's like the us open is the one where you know there's a few more upsets people come towards the end mm-hmm. of the season there's a few injuries and all that sort of stuff but actually given i don't know people's yeah, I mean, there have been injuries this time as well and people's differing kind of form and all that sort of stuff. Like a lot of the seeded players haven't been playing as well as they maybe normally have. And then you've got like a few younger guys coming through uh, and obviously old stalwarts like Mazza and Djokovic is still going. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the biggest shock from the first week is Nadal really, isn't it? Like, let's, let's be honest. <laughs> like... <laughs> It's yeah. tough to say shock. I don't. I, really? I don't really feel like it's a shock. We dare I say it towards the end of last year, and and sort of earlier this year. Like you, it's not impossible to say that we've noticed a bit of a decline. We always expect Nadal to come out fighting, and you know he has that historic stamina that we all love. But it doesn't feel like a shock that he's out early. It feels <laughs> this is harsh, but it almost feels right. Um, which is a little interesting, but yeah, he just didn't have what it what have what it takes. He looked a bit slow, just wasn't quite wasn't quite himself. Yeah, well, I think well, not like uh, none, neither of us predicted him to win it, and okay. I, I'm still surprised he didn't make it to the second week. Like even if he's playing mm-hmm. poorly, like you still expect like as a minimum for him to get to the second week. Um, but even in that match when he lost, he was already nearly two sets down before he yeah. got the injury. So I think that's the more concerning thing. Like you can play through, like you can play through injury. We've seen that like last year, he beat Fritz while he was Wimbledon, like, yep. yeah, half his body was injured, and so he can still do that. But the fact that he, yeah, he was already getting almost out muscled a little bit in those first couple of sets. Um, that was the more worrying mm-hmm. thing, I think. And yeah, he just looks slower, like across, like side to side, forward to back. He just looks a bit slower than he has done. Mate. Age catches up with all of us, right? Um, so I it don't does, know. But for, but for some people, the age seems to, uh, well, it doesn't seem to matter. Andy Murray is, well, he was on in some incredible form. I'll tell you what, for me, he made the first week of the men's draw for me. He made it as interesting as it possibly could be um, based on, oh, God, I wish I had an ounce of his fight an ounce of his determination and, and just that that will not to give up. Even when it looks like he's two sets and a breakdown against Kokonakis and he still finds a way with a metal hit to come back and win it in, in the longest match in his career. I mean, I don't know. I don't think any of the other big three have quite what it means to be Murray in their head. I think it's just stubbornness. <laughs> I think in his head, he's like, fight. it doesn't matter what it is. You can give everyone, him whatever word you want. Everyone expects him to to lose or not be able to compete with these guys. And in his head, he's like, no, nah, I've still got it. Like, even he even does. when I'm not 
yeah, like I haven't got a, f a fully human body anymore. Like I can still compete with these guys. I think that's what it is. And like you can see him, like getting the crowd on side and all that stuff, and the whole like ear to the crowd. That, and that, that point, that <laughs> point, Tanasi Kokonaka should have won that point. And the fact that Murray comes off winning it, that was the moment the match completely turned around as well. Um, and it's not like the match completely turned around in, in the fact that Kokonakis went away. It was just, just Murray was superb. It was, it was, it made his, it made him beating Berrettini in the first round. It made that look like less impressive than that was, because that match with Kokonakis was some of the best tennis I've ever seen. Let alone some of the best tennis I've seen those two play. Um, because it's not like his, you know, Kokonakis' serve or his forehand weren't working. It's not like any of that went away. It was just that defense, that movement. Murray started to do some of the stuff that we've not seen before. He started to shorten the point, you know, hits that flat back on down forbid. the line. God forbid, exactly. This is where, this is where you know, if he takes that throughout a year and stays fit, stays healthy, stays strong with that body, you could genuinely see some serious damage from him this year on the tour, which would be, which would just be fascinating. Um, but yeah, God made the first week for me a little bit sad with Bautista Agu that he didn't come through it. Um, didn't expect him to two, five setters brutal, but yeah, maybe if they hadn't been two, five setters, maybe we'd be having a different conversation about Murray in the second week. I think that was one of the coldest handshakes I've ever seen after a match. <laughs> <laughs> I think Bautista got a bit wound up by the fact that the, pretty much like 99% of the crowd was behind Murray. But I think you got to kind of acknowledge his history there and like him getting to the final yeah. so, so many times and not quite getting there and then having the injury and all that stuff and adversity. People are naturally just going to side with that because he's in effect like one of their champions, even though he didn't actually win it. So mm. I think mm. you just got to swallow your ego a little bit sometimes with those things and just be like, well, understand like the significance of certain players in the history of tennis really so yeah, yeah that was yeah. <laughs> that was that was interesting i think yeah with murray it's actually frustrating it's actually almost frustrating me because i'm like how like yeah with them if he didn't play five sets yeah so often or if he didn't have a slow start so often or whatever he, like you said before like he could be getting to the second week like no problem and like what could he actually be capable of doing is yeah mm. it's quite exciting but he needs to get through some matches relatively comfortably first and i think playing that more aggressive a little bit more aggressive style will help that like it always seems to happen when lendl comes in it's like he starts attacking the forehand especially like down the line and all that stuff which helps but obviously he's in his head he's always like there's more risk with that shot and if he makes errors that yeah. like really annoys him because he's like one of those players that just like more than any other should like doesn't want to miss and prefers to play that kind of counter punching style you say that though but with the modern game all of the different things that we've got in tennis now you know all of the add-ons the strings the rackets the balls because obviously the balls were a bit heavier and slower so you kind of had to attack at the australian open um if if you're not then someone else will be and that's when you start to lose matches i think this is where we've seen some of these upsets the slower balls have really um made it a little bit different but unlike Andy Murray, or even like Andy Murray starting to do a little bit more of and probably needs to do more of, Novak Djokovic has certainly made an impact this week. The way he dismantled De Minor, uh, which for me is today, um, it made him look like he, you know, was someone ranked 250 in the world and Novak Djokovic was playing. But De Minor was actually playing quite well. It's just one of those sad things where what Djokovic does so well now is without making any extra errors, he's hitting seven, eight miles an hour more on that ball, or is it kilometers an hour? Probably kilometers. But he's hitting that much more pace on the ball, but without the errors. That That's insane. Like normally you can get sort of three or four uh, extra kilometers an hour and, you know, then errors start to creep in. All these players, you know, they're playing at the almost the fastest that you can humanly play tennis. Um but again, Djokovic is just, he's just that, that bit ahead. He can time it just that, that bit better. And, and his movement allows him to do that. Yeah, they were showing his contact points compared to two years ago when he last played. And he's like, I don't know, a metre or more, like at least a few feet closer up to the baseline. Obviously, because of that yeah. injury, he's just even more like attacking now. He doesn't want really to get put on the stretch, especially on his like backhand side, I think it is, which is because of his 
left legs where he's got the injury. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Like, Dimino has been playing well, but he's not the kind of player that I would think would trouble Novak anyway because he's just like, not to be too <laughs> brutal, but he's almost just like a lesser version of Novak the way he plays because it's just side to side, just trying to get balls back deep with a bit of pace. And there's no, he, to me, doesn't really have any big Djokovic weapons. Djokovic hit through him. Yeah. Djokovic hit through him in a way that, so Dimonor, yeah, you're right. He doesn't have very many big weapons, but what he is, is one of the fastest guys on a tour. Um, and I would argue based on that, one of the better defenders. He couldn't get near a thing. So again, it, it does. It makes a t- it. It sounds like very little difference considering they hit the ball however fast they do, but it it does. It makes a massive difference. It genuinely made it to me. It made it look like if I went away and played a pro tennis player, the, the change in speed would be so much that I'd be like, well, well, "What? I can't time the ball anymore." Mm. So it's uh, yeah. Again, even at the top level, there are different levels. Yeah, like Devin was twenty second seed. It's not like he's. A mug or anything like he's exactly a decent player, yeah. Very good player, yeah. yeah I think the only <laughs> you're gonna get you probably get a little bit annoyed when I say this. The only player I see giving in Djokovic any issues is Sissa Pass on current form because I think he's got he's got weapons that could hurt Novak and get him on the run more than because Dimonor again, like we said, his player mm-hmm. kind of rely almost relies a little bit on other players making errors, you know, just getting more balls back, yeah. Whereas Sissipas is someone that could get Djokovic on the run in the rally, and then you might see that leg issue start to become more of a thing. Um, whereas, yeah, yesterday it was just Novak was just getting the first hit in every point pretty much and wasn't really doing a lot of running. So, yeah. yeah absolutely not. Um, what about on the women's side? We've got, we've, well, I mean, we didn't have a shock on the women's side, a particular. I mean, big shock. more than one shock, but the big shock, obviously, is our number one is, is out. I mean, didn't see that coming. Not not to put down Rybakina, for example, but you know, don't expect for Fiancet to be out. Yeah, <laughs> she should she... be back in second week at least. I don't know whether like she didn't play that badly. She got a little bit mm-hmm. overpowered from what I could see. Like, you know, how have you how do you say her name? R- Rybakina, Rybakina. <laughs> I'm not. We've had this before. Sure. I'm just saying <laughs> what I've read. <laughs> R- Please Rubikina. feel free to correct us, anyone that is listening. Um, we'll say what we're going to say. <laughs> yeah, let's see how we go with that. That yeah. lady, the tall lady from Kazakhstan, the excellent <laughs> tennis player. Yeah, um, yeah, just like weapons again, like big serve, the biggest mm. serve of, of any female player, perhaps. Uh, One of the bigger yeah. and grind stroke speed as well. Like she did have. There was a few games where she went off it a little bit, but like when she's on it with those with on backhand and forehand side, she was just she was pushing Swiatek around like not any player can really do. Maybe like maybe there's like a handful that could get in a contest with her, but she was literally like bullying her from the baseline, yeah. which is crazy. I mean, I don't want to put down you know the feat that she has pulled off here, you know, to take out the world number one and who who is arguably on very very good form at the moment, but you know the the style of the tournament and the the conditions may have suited that play a lot more so again i was talking earlier about you know novak benefiting from you know these slower heavier tennis balls uh, and being able if you don't attack someone else will well arguably this is where we say well sviontek didn't really use her full weapons and attack and that's where she let in someone who well okay you know i'm up against the world number one i may as well i may as well go for it yeah, I don't know if she's gonna. Well, she's got. I suppose she's got a good chance of winning it, hasn't she? But I always get s- skeptical with these players. I mean, if she has won, she did win Wimbledon, so that just gives it a little bit more mm-hmm. credibility to it. But sometimes when you beat a big player, then you drop off a little bit in the next match, like not even consciously, but you just yeah. Yeah. But I don't know. She seems quite calm to me, so she. She could just go all the way, really, because she yeah she doesn't seem particularly phased. She barely even celebrated winning the match. It's just like again yeah, when thanks. when you see the way she played, I I don't see I don't see there being a completely different person in that next match if that makes sense. So um, yeah, I'm expecting I'm expecting to see more more of her. Um, yeah, 
yeah, she's up against Ostapenko next, so I'd, I'd expect her to win that match. Um, there is one player that your prediction is still alive. On both my prediction is still side. alive. Mine yes. absolutely both shocking. of mine are. <laughs> Neither of yours are. I will take All that. All right. One. Yeah. So, well, one of my predictions has a hamstring injury, but apparently it's fine according to him today. Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, with, with Pagula, for example. Um, yeah, I think we're seeing some good stuff. She's doing quite well in the doubles as well, um, which is which is good to see. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm hoping to see her go all the way. I think she's got what got what it takes. Again, <clears throat> whether whether someone comes along who's slightly better at taking that ball earlier, getting through more attacking sense of play, maybe that could shift her off a little bit. But yeah, again, the a lot of the Americans are doing very well in this tournament, and she mm. she is leading that line. Yeah, there's only, I think <clears throat> when I'm looking at the draw now, it's her, Ribikina, and Sabalenka are probably yeah. the ones I would look for. The favourites, uh, at least. Yeah, yeah. Then again, it's hard to tell, you know, sometimes women's tennis is going to be a bit <clears> up and down. <throat> but yeah, based on what I've seen, I think those three are looking like the most consistent, the most aggressive. Um, so yeah, maybe your prediction is... Maybe you'll get that one. And, I mean, Djokovic is... It's not like you've gone out a li- on a limb with Djokovic. Have no, you, so. I've not really gone out on a limb with Djokovic, but... On a yeah, hamstring. But, uh... but I'll tell you one thing that's interesting, and you're going to like this. I'll tell you what, as the, as the person who chose the topic for the rest of this discussion, you're going to really like how I segue into it right now. So there is a little bit of a theory going around the internet at the moment and it's very lightly <laughs> light-hearted <laughs> not there. but very entertaining so there's been a little documentary that's been released uh which we're going to discuss called breakpoint on netflix um what is interesting is none of the stars of breakpoint if you've watched this series uh have made the second week in fact a lot of them never even made the first week they were injured before they were allowed into the tournament so a little bit entertaining there but is there a curse going around what do you reckon could be it's like almost like that do you remember the aaron ramsey curse yeah <laughs> that was a little bit more sinister but that like, was that was way. a little over the top yeah <laughs> <laughs> you could be right if it feels a bit i don't know it's quite funny that the first episode's about curios and then he doesn't actually <laughs> make it to the aussie open oh uh, i don't know yeah spoiler alert people we are going to talk about stuff that's happened um yeah, I don't know. It felt a little that first episode felt a little bit more like reality TV. <laughs> Sorry, can we just stop at the we're gonna talk about stuff that's happened? Yeah. Is that what we always do. <laughs> no, I anyway. was gonna talk about the weather or something. I don't know. Yeah, moving moving on. <laughs> so they, they kind of yeah. They talk about yeah, they document Kyrgios as kind of off the court stuff, let's say. Him and his girlfriend and he's got a good relationship with Kokonakis, obviously. It was good actually to see like kind of the replays and stuff from from last year through their doubles mm. run because actually at the time I didn't actually see a lot of that. Um, but that was like I think the, the final of the doubles last year had almost the same as the men's singles one, which is like pretty yeah. much unheard of. Obviously they are Australian as well, but like you know it's Kyrgios bringing fireworks and even Kokonakis yeah. is like he's a bit eccentric as well. Like compared to Kyrgios, he looks normal, but when you yeah. see him in singles, you're like, hey, he's got like, yeah, there's a little bit of like electricity about him. For example, take that point where Murray just kept getting his smashes back. He immediately goes and destroys his racket at the end of the point. It's like he planned to destroy his racket at the end of that point. It's like win or loss. Damn. So, yeah. It's not to say he's not an emotional fella as well. Yeah, he just looks pretty tame compared to Nick but <laughs> he's the one trying to keep Nick in check which is kind of yeah it's just hilarious yeah. the, the two of them are just nuts but anyway yeah that was good to see special but... K's oh, that's yeah. what they call them <laughs> sorry <laughs> that's kind of it's, it's probably a bit ironic the fact that special K is quite a boring serial and they've kind of used that to describe yeah. them yeah I don't know come up with it let's come up with a better nickname than that come on we can do better. Um, yeah, I don't know. Do, how, how much have you seen of it? Obviously, you would have probably seen that Kyrgios episode. I just felt... I don't know. They're trying to get people into tennis. I appreciate that. Yeah. But, uh, I just... I don't know. It felt a little bit like... 
reality TV with like the girlfriends and stuff. Same with the Berrettini thing. I mean, I know yeah. he's dating a another or was dating another. I was going to say but... was not anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of funny watching that, and it's like, well, yeah, these two are not together anymore. But... So you bring up a good point in the t- the idea that it's like reality TV. So um, from what I from what I watched of it. My impression is that it it sort of seeks to do two major things, this documentary. So if you haven't watched it, this may be a little bit of a selling point for you or not. It might help you decide not to watch it at all. Um, first thing is it's introducing sort of this new brand of talent, uh, sort of these, these newer players, the people who are theoretically the future at the top of tennis. Um, part of me wants to say that maybe this documentary with those players except maybe Kyrgios that first episode was a real winner I think um everyone wanted to see it and I think it it played out very very well uh it also had a lovely story throughout it you know like blah 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 you know struggle struggle singles loss doubles win you know that's oh what great what a great story but a lot of the episodes it feels like oh maybe this is all a bit too soon maybe this should have been done in about 2 or 3 years time so per- perhaps you could argue that the series is a little premature in the premise with those players i think a lot of people are still reeling from the idea of the big 4 you know you'd rather hear more of the sort of sad stories andy murray resurfacing don't think it's going to be more successful than that because you know and i know that's a rival platform but that resurfacing documentary told a story we were all very invested in, especially if you live in England or the UK, for example, um, because, you know, that's that's the real struggle. The other thing this tried to do as a series, which I thought it did quite nicely, um, was introduce the concept of the psychology of the game and, and sort of the stress that a lot of these players are under. <clears throat> People often criticise, this is why I really like that first episode as well, often criticise Nick Kyrgios, for being the bad boy. Oh, he's such a reckless person. Oh, he's such he throws tantrums all the time. But say you're not the most mentally sound, and I'm not saying that he's not mentally sound, but you know, in any case, say you're struggling with any aspect of mental health in any way, say you're having a bad day with your family, anything like that, you step on a tennis court and you go through those emotions, the loneliness, all of the things that accompany that you can kind of understand why he has acted the way he has uh, in the past. So, yeah, I think it was a very, very accurate portrayal. Um, but, again, I still feel like the series was a little bit premature. Because, yeah, a lot of these young players haven't, like... I they haven't really made it, made it yet. Yeah. Are they? Are they <laughs> the next generation? I'm still asking that question. Matteo Berrettini, and you're asking, oh, is he the next generation? Well, he loses in the first round to Murray. Well, I'm much more interested in Murray's story now again, so I might go back and watch resurfacing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's well, because, yeah, people try to liken it to the Formula One run, right? But with Formula One, you know yeah. who the best, <clears throat> like, the be- you know what the best cars are, and you pretty much know like who's going to win and where people lie in the kind of pecking order. Um, but there are political motivations as well. There are teams, you know, whereas in tennis, it's not like, oh, I'm suddenly going to join Team Greece or something like that. You can't do that. Like, There's none of that sort of politics as much. I don't know. It can't quite live up to those documentaries in the same way. Certainly not like All or Nothing, for example, or any of the football documentaries that are out there. It, it's just not, there's not that depth of information that people are interested in. Yeah, and there's also... Uh, well, there's just so many. There's so many different players, right? Like, apart from the top few guys who you, you kind of know are going to be there or thereabouts or win yep. big tournaments, <clears throat> then you've got so many other players that like could do well one tournament, could do badly another tournament, and then yeah. it's like hard to form, like you said, a, like an allegiance around players like that when you know. It's so it's still so up and down and inconsistent. Whereas you know, with team sports and stuff, you're kind of with them anyway. But yeah. it's a little bit more <clears throat> different in tennis because you're not necessarily always going to just support someone from your own country, for example, like through thick and thin. You're looking for other players. Like, I mean, obviously, like Federer was my favorite player. He's not from the UK. Like, I still supported Murray, but yep. Federer I knew was going to be like there or thereabouts in pretty much 
every tournament and obviously I like the way he played, all that sort of stuff. So it was like, I can watch this tournament for a long period of time and be invested in it. Whereas, Ooh. yeah, like you said, it's quite early with some of these younger players, although some of them aren't actually that young. Like, you know, Berrettini's like in his mid 20s, but. But that's another side of it. This documentary is sort of sold as introducing a new era of talent, but, you know, they've actually been around quite a while. And I'm not saying they're not talented and I'm not saying they're not some of the best tennis players in the world, but um, the term top 20 felt loose to me. You know, yeah, mm. top 20, because that encompasses 10 to 20, which is a, a rapidly changing degree of competitors you know 10 to 20 in the women's and the men's game probably the women's game more so is constantly changing so it, it's it's tough it's a tough sell given again a lot of these other documentaries in other sports they're set around establishments teams that you know you know uh team mclaren and, and formula one and all of these sorts you know you, you have your you have your favorite teams you have your favorite cars Sometimes you have your favorite people, but that doesn't always become the case. Football, yeah, everyone's got their favorite team. Even if you don't really like football, I reckon you've probably got your favorite team. Tennis is a hard thing, even when you love tennis, to even like the people. So, yeah, it, it, it's a tough sell on that regard, sort of a tell-all on your favorite players. Well, it's more, it's interesting, and I found it very interesting, naturally, but hard sell on that front. Yeah, I think also, well... The one, one of the episodes, there's a couple of episodes that I did like more than others. I like, quite like the the Fritz one because of mm. like the the adversity in him, like the story they told around it and like the coach who used to coach, was it Sampras or someone like that and yeah, now coaching yeah, yeah. him. And then the fact that he was playing Nadal in the final of his home tournament, like that's a good story. So you can follow that quite yeah. easily. So that was quite a good one. And then I quite like the the one about Anjabur because it's it's different from a lot of the other players where she's come from mm. and like the struggles of I don't know getting sponsorship for example from a country where tennis is not so much supported financially yeah yeah yeah. and showing her personality quite nicely and the fact she had like her husband as like her trainer or whatever which again is like different and I don't know shows I guess financially as well maybe like her situation being different from other players I thought that was an interesting storyline and yeah. that's one people could definitely follow like more or get on side with more easily than other ones again it's almost like coming against adversity isn't it and getting to the top but i would argue that's again that's some that actually it's kind of this is where the principle of the series um comes in similar to what we try and do with this podcast so we're always trying to expose and bring out sort of more grassroots a little bit more of the stuff in tennis that not everyone always talks about you don't always hear about it's not in the media all the time it's not headline news but it's stuff that you know if you're interested in tennis and and you play it all the time at any level it's the stuff that you should probably either know or think about or you know it is interesting to you the documentary does that quite nicely it does bring out all these different things because the psychological element of tennis isn't always um oh they're hitting a ball at me harder i'm going to struggle with that what am I going to do? That That's not always it. Like There are a lot of different aspects and stories within tennis that determine how easy it is. And and that funding angle as well that was uh, played with on Bird, that's something that a lot of people probably relate to. No matter what country you're in, no matter how that beast unravels itself for you, it's something that people can relate to. Um, so I thought that was a rather nice touch. Um, and I would agree with you. That was a good story to tell. Yeah, I think that's one of the more important <clears throat> sides of it to show. Obviously, that like the whole mental side of things because it's an individual yeah. sport. I think you got to go into these things that are like quite specific to tennis that almost differentiates it for good or bad compared to like other sports. So obviously, that funding yeah. thing is like a major aspect to it because it's like, oh yeah, you you pretty much have to be the only way you can make a living out of it is get into the top. I don't know, a hundred maybe, like consistently. Um, because of all the travel and like the teams you have to employ around you and all that sort of stuff. Um, so that's, yeah, that's why I quite, I quite like that, that storyline. I mean, even take um, Nori, for example, like, you know, British player, but he was born in South Africa, then he moved mm -hmm. to New Zealand and then he came over to the UK when he was what, like 18 or something because he was struggling for funding <clears> and the only way he was going to be able to get to the top was to come over to 
somewhere like the UK that has a bit yeah, more funding yeah, yeah. for tennis players. And then obviously went over to America as well. There's, there's yeah. yeah, things like that that people won't know about, but are like a massive part of, of tennis. Yeah. And like what kind of makes it a little bit different from other sports. So. Well, it's actually something they said in the first five minutes of the episode, the idea that, you know, if, if you're not, because they did a nice job of um, pitching this documentary to a target audience of people who might not actually know anything about tennis. So they didn't go into nitty gritty tactics and technical stuff and, oh, this player does this and oh, I don't like that because she does something better than that one and all that, blah, blah, blah. You know, that that's a lot of jargon that we probably do talk about. Um, but at least this was pitched to an audience of people who don't necessarily know tennis. So probably within the first 10 minutes, we we knew how the scoring worked. They probably yeah. explained that two or three times. That was nice. Um, and, it, you know, they did it quite quickly, but, you know, it's something that people can probably get, uh, get from. Um, but they were also, the first thing that I was hearing, if you're not winning, you're not making money. I was like, oh, that's actually something that would probably take me by surprise a little bit. I know that. But the fact that they're saying it outright, it's just like, well, that really hits home. Bloody hell, that's a hard sport. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, these unique things to tennis. And, like, obviously, if you're trying to get people into watching tennis, you don't need to introduce the tactics and all that stuff anyway, because if they do then become interested, they will learn that as they go along anyway. So it's, yeah, it's just getting those basics going. And I think the the scoring can be a little strange, as we've talked about before, like how Mm. the scoring works in games and stuff. And yeah, but yeah, they did quite a nice job of that. The other thing I was going to say is like, I think from a storyline perspective, I think the actual second half of the season and obviously therefore the second part of the the series is going to be a little bit more interesting because they've kind of already, mm. uh, you know, like hinted at Alcaraz and like a little bit about him. And now obviously that's going to feed into like, you know, the next part where they move into like, uh, well, so we've done French Open, haven't we? We're going into Wimbledon and then obviously like later down the line, he does, he wins the US Open and stuff. And I think that will, mm. like Alcaraz is going to be a major selling point, I think, for this kind of series if you're trying to get behind like a new young player who like credibly could be at the top and be at the top for a long period of time and i also yeah. think i don't know there wasn't much on sinner but i feel like <clears throat> that's a, a, another angle that could be used as well um they can't yeah. they can't always meet everyone and get and go no, again no. it's only the people that are probably accepted being this you know filmed behind the scenes and all that. so yeah, it's a pretty invasive True. documentary in many ways you know they are following around with the camera a lot you know just come off the court you've lost i hardly think nick Kyrgios was exactly happy having that camera shoved in his face um <laughs> yeah but um, i suppose you know down the corridor if you sign up to this then you kind of know that that's going to be sort of part of it and like if you want the yeah. i don't know the attention or whatever that comes with the series then you're going to have to show some stuff that like you know you might not really want to show but it's going to show like the reality of the sport and that kind of thing so yeah you kind of you know these things when you sign up to it but yeah is it, it'll be interesting to see what kind of players feed into the narrative later down mm-hmm. the line obviously curious will come back into it again with like wimbledon and stuff yeah. So I actually think that second half of the season will be a bit more interesting, but yeah, it's always frustrating. It'd be interesting to see how these things unravel. Yeah, it's a bit, I don't know, it's almost frustrating that they didn't just release the whole thing. Because with with the Formula One, they just released the whole thing, right? And I I don't know whether splitting it into two parts is going to... I think it's nice... I think it's nice in terms of you get a little bit of feedback. I mean, if I'm the producers, and I'm not sure that they're going to do it this way, but if I'm the producers um, and the editors, more importantly, I'd want a little bit of feedback on what people like about it before I then release the second half, because then you can tailor the storylines a little bit to increase the things that people are interested in. Because you know, it's it's a, they don't know how well this is going to work. They don't know that this is going to be as effective as it has been for football and Formula One to be two specific examples. So it is a bit of a different equation. So the formula does have to be a little different. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. no, it's interesting. Yeah. I, I I quite like though that I liked that there was a mental health uh, aspect, and I think a lot of sports don't come quite as close to the honesty as this series did like like the chat that they had with paula Badosa and, and how excruciatingly honest uh she was about the effect of tennis on her mental health um 
uh, and the way that Kyrgios talked about it, you know, Kokonakis talking about himself and Kyrgios and, and hearing the manager's perspectives, coaches. I thought that was really nice. Um, and I think more of that will help because if you do get someone who's coming up as a great player, say, say Carlos Alcaraz is one of these examples, it's quite nice to have a little bit of that in the background as they start winning things to understand the the reason. And th- that can only help endear fans, I think, to a lot of these players. Yeah, I think you, you just want to know the person better, right? You don't just want to have them, oh, yeah. I lost, I feel bad, or oh, I won, I feel good. Like, yeah. <laughs> All right, Andy. <laughs> Stop talking like Andy Murray. How did you do that? What an impression. I'm just so honest. Like, <laughs> uh, uh, He hit the ball and I, I hit it back. Yeah, <laughs> it's a good thing he wasn't directing this series, just put it that way. <laughs> or commentating on it, yeah. Anyway. Oh, gosh, yeah. Anyway, yeah, there are there are good parts to it. And yeah, I suppose that, yeah, you make a good point about them kind of listening to feedback and stuff. So it'd be interesting to see how that affects the second half of the season. Um, but also, yeah. also, why is Nadal some sort of weird god in this series? I, I get he's one of our like tennis gods, but everyone seems to be compared to Nadal. Oh, I played a match against Nadal and it didn't go well. Oh, I played a match against Nadal and it did go well. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I played a match against Nadal. Everything's about him somehow in the episode. He's one of the goats, mate. That's that's how it is. Yeah, I know, but edit a bit of that out, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Give us us your thoughts on on the documentary and all that sort of stuff. And yeah, if you liked it, give us a a follow on Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. And on YouTube, give it a like, share it around and subscribe and we will see you in the next one.